Hi everyone, welcome to the Wisconsin Resource Center for Charter Schools session on designing an equitable portfolio of charter schools. I'm Sarah Hackett and I'm joined today by Nick Pertaski. Today at the session, we're going to be talking about um, some high level things and some also um, some in the weeds ideas as well. We'll talk about how charter schools are the solution for a lot of communities to meet the needs of educationally disadvantaged students. We'll talk about involving the community and key stakeholders in designing an equitable portfolio of charter schools. And then we'll talk about accountability and performance measures for charter schools and the alignment with other schools in your district, as well as the vision for your district as a whole. All right, so to get started, why don't you just take a moment and reflect on these two questions that you see on your, on your screen. What is the purpose of a school board member for your district? What is your, what is your role? Um, why do you attend meetings? Who are you representing is the second question. Who, who in your, in your, in, is the ultimate person or people that you are representing as you're sitting on the school board? And if you have an opportunity, you can pause this or at least jot this down. Really think through every time you go to your school board meeting, what is the purpose? Who are you representing? And does the, does the system in which you currently work, you currently serve as a school board member, does it support that purpose? Do you feel like the time being spent at these meetings and your oversight, is it supporting all of those folks that you represent? How do you know that? And are there different ways? Thanks. Hey. I'll get started now. This is kind of just going to frame out the why of our session. Why would you have a portfolio of schools in your district? And why would you have it look different than kind of it typically does? So what does it look like and why have the portfolio? Here's a really um, complicated image, but one that I think helps us just kind of frame the whole um, school setting in our state. So we have our parents have options in this state. No matter where you are, our parents have options. And some of the options are with your school districts and some aren't. And so just acknowledging the reality of where we live and now with COVID-19, we also have, uh, I think more and more parents just sort of rethinking their options. And so I wanted to put it all in one diagram. So it's kind of split in half at the start. You have your public school options and you have non-public school options. There's private schools, those private schools, some of them are part of the state um, choice program. And then we also have homeschool uh, opportunities for families. And so that's kind of that half of the diagram. The other half are our public school options. Within that, you have uh, choices within your resident district and there's open enrollment. There's also independently authorized charter schools that are not part of geographic school districts. So just sort of acknowledging that there's all these different places that parents are potentially thinking about sending their students and knowing where you fit in, I think is really important. So as you kind of zero in on school district here, you know that within your school district, you also have some choices. Almost certainly all of you have multiple neighborhood schools or even within a single school building, you may be operating multiple schools. Some of them are traditional and some of them are more focused. You know, you may have virtual programs or a virtual school. You may have some kind of magnet or at-risk school that's operating within a building or out on its own. And so just acknowledging, I think that we have these things already helps us think about the whole system and that our parents are looking at an even bigger system when you take into account the independently authorized charters, the private school, the home school, virtual um, options and open enrollment and things that are sort of out of the realm of this part of the diagram. So anything that's kind of up and over here um, are things that aren't necessarily part of your immediate structure. Um, so I just wanted to take a minute to kind of think about that and knowing, um, help us know that district authorized charter schools are one way to kind of broaden the offerings within your school district to give your families more opportunities rather than having them choose some options outside of your school district. 
So why authorize a charter school? Here, for those of you that have seen Sarah and I's discussions at past WASB conferences, or, or we have come and worked with your local school district, you, you've probably seen this slide. But for those of you that haven't, we at least wanna, wanna set the stage here. And then the rest of this video is gonna describe more in detail some other possible advantages or maybe opportunities um, that your school district could gain by having a charter school. But first of all, innovation centers, an opportunity at, at a smaller, more micro level um, to, to try on a new idea um, and to use that charter school to infuse um, that innovation throughout the rest of your district, but starting small and then, and then growing that bigger. Learning improvement, if there's a certain area that you have identified on your needs assessments um, and you wanted to directly impact that with a specifically designed school, um, that aligns with meeting the needs of all learners, um, as well as there are opportunities um, charter schools could bring for financial sustainability. And that could look as from a, from a more macro view of your entire district, um, by, by having different options for families, it could keep those families in your district rather than wanting to, to, to choose to open and enroll elsewhere or to, to potentially leave your district to be homeschooled. They, they see themselves in a, in a school in your district, as well as at the micro level of an individual charter school, they might be able to create some policies or practices um, that, that help solve uh, some, some other sustainability issues financially for your district. Community connections, oftentimes um, our charter schools are located out in the community or they're parts of community um, groups or buildings already or those communities are participating right in the doors of a charter school. So it's just strengthening the ties that our districts have with those uh, with, different, with different community organizations. And then lastly, and Sarah really did a great job in the last slide hitting this, is just choice for your families, opportunities for each one of their children. So what we would suggest for you, and there is a link in, in bullet point number four here. So if you do download this slide deck, this is a live link to a very brief district assessment, um, but you could use it at least as, as, a, as a talking point for your own um, site specific needs, but really looking at where are your potential areas of need in your district? Are some of those needs surfacing or resurfacing every year or every other year when you do a, a deep dive into your district of needs? And could a charter school, an intentionally designed school or a set of intentionally designed portfolio of schools help meet those specific needs in your district or pilot different solutions for those needs? Um, and if is your current plan still missing one subsection of those of those needs and could you put energy and time um, through a charter school to meet those needs and so really using that that needs assessment the data from that will determine the design of your school or the the request from your district of these are the schools that we're looking to authorize and so if you have an, an application process for outside entities to apply to your district to, to have a charter school, you could have specific pieces in your application that align to the needs that you are seeing um, in your district. Great. Um, so our first section was really about the why and understanding the setting. Now I'm gonna get a little bit more into the logistics of just what is a charter school? How do they work? That kind of thing. Um, so charter schools are public non-sectarian schools created through a business-like contractor charter between a charter governance board and an authorizing school board or other chartering entity. We have charter schools all over the state in Wisconsin in every CESA, all 12 CESAs, um, and in 90 plus um, school districts in the state. We have 96 active authorizers, but a few of them are universities and other entities. Um, 236 charter schools in all in the state, and that number is expecting to grow in the next year. 
Um, we keep a charter schools yearbook and a kind of um, live infographic on our website that you can always check back on these numbers if you want to know more about which districts are authorizing, where the charter schools are. And this is an interactive map as well, so you can click on any of these schools to learn more about the offerings and um, the different types of charters throughout the state. And then I just have a quick summary and a few resources for you. Um, chartering really just talks about that contract between the governance board and the authorizer. The contract, um, Nick will get into a little bit more soon, but it really spells out like the purpose of the charter school and the expectations of the charter school and how they're going to fulfill the idea um, laid out between the authorizer and the governance board. A charter school allows the student to attend um, at no cost to the family. It's a free school, it's a public school. All school districts in the state are able to serve as charter school authorizers, um, but they, they don't have to. It's just, um, it's in the statute that all are able to. Um, and then there are also some independent charter school authorizers that are able to serve as authorizers. Um, so I will get into that uh, in just a moment. So what is authorizing? I'm saying that you are an authorizer, but I haven't explained it yet. So here we go. Um, so authorizing is the act of creating that contract with a charter school governance board and holding them accountable. So in exchange for the autonomy that you give to the governance board, to come up with this idea and operate a school, you are holding them accountable to the results that you expect to see um, as, as a result of them doing this school. So certain performance measures um, and outcomes. And we'll get into some ideas for that shortly. Um, the flow of accountability for a charter school really is um, that the U.S. Constitution, uh, you know, allows for this. Our state has charter school law. We also have state statutes for schools, state accountability measures through DPI, and open meeting law that holds the governance board accountable to accepting those public dollars. We also have in our statute um, certain charter school authorizing entities, and like I said, um, those are the, um, oh, and we got some arrows here. Those are the, um, all the school districts and then um, all the public universities and tech schools in the state and a few other public entities. And I think I've got them on a slide coming up here. And then you create the contract with the governance board to fulfill the duties of operating the school and they'll be held to their bylaws um, as an entity in the state as a nonprofit entity. Um, and we'll ask you for certain waivers and things in that contract. So it really is um, a flow of autonomy of accountability and autonomy. The role of the authorizers to ensure success for the charter school. Um, and uphold the best practices for the schools, encourage and endorse autonomy, and assure student and public interests. The authorizers in the state are the public school districts, like I mentioned, the institutions of higher ed, um, that are all public institutions in the state. So any of the two or four year colleges and all of the tech school boards. We also have two tribal colleges and then we have the UW system administrative office um, that has the office of educational opportunity. Then we have two public non-educational government entities, the common council of the city of Milwaukee and the Waukesha County exec. And so those are all the people who can, all the entities that are able to authorize in our state, but um, they don't all actively authorize schools currently. Um, so I just wanted to put out there that these are um, the potentials. And so, like I said, of the 400 some districts, about 100 of them currently authorize. There's two types of district authorized charter schools. So if you choose to be an authorizer of a charter school, you can decide to have the staff of the charter school be staff of your school district, 
or you could choose to have the staff of the charter school not be staff of the district, they would be staff of the governance board. And so that's really the difference between the terms instrumentality and non-instrumentality. The only dis difference is the staffing contracts. And that's a choice that you and the governance board would make together. If you choose to authorize a school, you can say that you'd only authorize instrumentality schools or non-instrumentality, um, or you can leave it open to negotiation. There's lots of different autonomies that you can include in the contract. And this is just one of them that our state sort of calls out and has a term for. Um, and so it's something that often um, authorizers and governance boards talk about first when negotiating the contract. The authorizing cycle is a helpful tool when thinking about all the things that a charter school authorizer does. It's a little bit different than your day-to-day -day work as a school board because you do have to create that contract and think about some really specific performance measures. Um, and then there also is the process of the application. And so Nick will get into some of those um, in a little bit in terms of kind of how you would want to implement those things. But I wanted to point out that we do have a lot of resources for thinking about that whole idea of having a school design creating some performance measures and a contract and then holding them accountable to it. And that's kind of the mindset that we want to talk about with our authorizers is that it is this sort of ongoing cycle of innovation and of accountability. You have some legal responsibilities as an authorizer. Um, and like I said, you're written into the statute as an authorizer. And so the statute expects that you solicit and evaluate charter school applications um, and that you use the NAXA principles and standards. We also have a Wisconsin specific version, which may be more helpful. Um, and then that you really think about high quality serving educationally disadvantaged students and, um, and monitoring the performance of your schools. So um, we have more details about that, but I just wanted to get us started on um, some of the basic legal responsibilities. All right, how does chartering work? Chartering, as I mentioned earlier, is really about that contract. Um, and this is where it starts to, we really start to get in the weeds and something that we can work with you one-on-one -on -one as you start to form a gov as a governance board is formed, you form your authorizing office and you really wanna start negotiating that contract. It's important to talk through kind of who has, um, who takes the lead on some of the conversations about these different pieces. And so um, governance board, tends to really handle the day-to-day -day operations of the budget, the mission, the operations, the staffing. Um, they share work with the authorizer when it comes to accountability and performance measures, but then the authorizer really has that ultimate oversight and renewal decision. And they also set expectations, which is what I think is so exciting about authorizing is that you really get to set that bar of what the school, um, what the school, is expected to be able to do in exchange for the autonomy that they were given. And then just a couple more slides about logistics and then we'll get into kind of the fun stuff of like how would this actually look in your community. Um, so Wisconsin governance boards, the people that you'd be making the contract with, do have to be filed with the state as an entity. Um, they're primarily non-stock, non-profit non and tax exempt entities. And they're held accountable to their public authorizer through the contract. They're also held to their bylaws and that they have to follow the open meeting laws and be transparent with all of their minutes and record keeping. So, um, so you're really creating a contract with this entity. The funding doesn't, um, the funding for a charter school, I'm going to skip right ahead to the um, to the graphic in a minute because it's a little bit easier to see, but um, we have district authorized charter schools and like I said there's two different um, types there's the instrumentality and non instrumentality, 
the funding still doesn't change um, until you get to what an uh, independent charter school, um, how an independent charter school is funded. Their funding stream is a little bit different as it goes directly from the state to the charter school. Um, with our district authorized charter schools, the governance board is the um, is financially responsible for the school, but oftentimes they make their district authorizer the fiscal agent and so um, the money may still be handled with the school district, even though technically it belongs to the charter schools governance board. But what's interesting is how that kind of financial exchange is figured out on a school by school basis. And so we don't have a set number for what the charter school receives in funding as it's totally up to whatever's negotiated in the contract between the charter school authorizer and the governance board of the charter school. Um, you know, oftentimes we recommend that the authorizer keeps an administrative fee and that um, all the autonomies are laid out and the financial autonomies are laid out in the contract. And then as well, um, we also recommend that the school and the authorizer negotiate purchase services that the school would want to purchase back from the school district. So there's a lot of different pieces that go into kind of how the finance works. But I guess the main thing to know is that they are one of your district schools and that likely you will be wanting to give them some financial autonomy. And so you'll need to think through kind of, you know, piece by piece of that finance, how that contract is going to look. And then finally, um, I wanted to just mention that DPI is also um, currently seeking applications for their net, for their federal charter school grant. Um, they're offering sub grants up to 900,000 for new um, planning and implementation schools, as well as expansion and replication of existing schools. So if you're interested in that, you may want to reach, reach out to DPI or to us to learn more. All right, I'm going to hand it over to Nick now for a while to talk a little bit more about how this would look. All right, so the topic for the day is is really looking at could charter schools in your district be leveraged to, to better meet the needs of all students, to better meet the needs that are coming up on those um, district-wide assessments that, that you've done, those needs assessments, and if there, are, if there are certain needs that have been popping up, how could we leverage charter schools to meet those needs? So the timeline um, for, for this process, it could look like this. Oftentimes it does. And we're just going to kind of hit on those top five. But you've identified some needs. And then in the, in, there's either been a pre-design. So you as a school district are working um, through a, a local group or part of the office or part of one of the schools is deciding to um, to either flip or to add a, a piece of their school, um, a co-located charter school, and they're working through the district, or you're creating an RFP. You're creating an application process for outside entities to apply to be a charter school in your district that meets those needs. Remember, we started with the needs first, and the RFP or the application is really kind of circling those needs to make sure that those outdoor outside entities are are going to have a unique way, a unique school design to meet your needs that you have pre-identified. Then there's an application process. Um, oftentimes you train a team um, to be able to look, look at those applications, review those applications. There might be um, interviews in that. There might be white papers with that. There's some sort of process to make sure that the, 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 the governance board, the leaders of this, of this charter school um, have um, both the, the interest, they a shared interest with you as a school district authorizer, but then they also have the competence um, and they have the awareness um, to, to be able to operate a school in your school district. And then there is the contact, contracting process. Sarah alluded to that and kind of highlighted some of those areas of importance, um, but really looking at what are those autonomies that the school gets um, or the, the school is, is using um, to, to better meet the needs um, in, their, in their model um, not necessarily better than the, than the other schools in the district. And then what are those clear performance measures that you as an authorizer have to help you monitor and measure the success of this charter school? Oftentimes contractors, contracts are from three to five years. Um, and throughout that process on a yearly basis, you're monitoring that, that progress, 
the success, um, the, the hiccups of those charter schools, all around those clear, transparent performance measures. And we're here to support you um, as an authorizer in creating that metrics or as charter schools and upwardly manage you as an authorizer and coming up with those performance measures. Um, and then there's some implementation, some annual monitoring, and then we're back into a, a reprocessing or reapplication phase. Um, but you're determining again, what are those indicators for you of success? What are the most important signs of a successful school in your district? How are you highlighting them? How, are, how is any group, whether it's organically happening through the school district office or it's happening from an outside group, group who's applying to your, um, through your RFP or your charter school application process, are they identifying those same needs or are there, is their program specifically designed to meet those indicators that you have said are important for your district. We do have um, some performance monitoring resources. We're not gonna take up too much of your time going deep into those, but um, we really feel that having, again, those, those clear transparent billboard type performance measures saying, hey, this is what the school does. These are the measurement tools that we use, and these are the indicators that that school is being successful. We're routine, routinely monitoring that, and if a, a school um, is not meeting one or, or several of those, what's the process? Is there, um, you know, is there is there school improvement planning that's happening? Is there an intervention from the authorizer to make sure that there is um, there's progress made to meeting those indicators? And then this is just sort of coming back up. It's a great diagram. Um, we, we explained it, but really at the middle of your relationship between the school district, school board, and the governing board of the charter school is that contract. And all of this is clearly spelled out. So the, the governing board knows what they need to show um, for performance. And again, school performance is not just test scores. It's important that we demonstrate student learning. It's important that we demonstrate growth. We want math and ELA, but we also want strong financial health. We also want safe and successful school operations. We want attendance. We want to make sure that, uh, that our parents and our community have perceptions that this school is meeting the needs. All of those are wrapped up into those performance measures, which is that bottom arrow that results going back to the, to the school district authorizer. So let's, let's look at this like from a, from a 50,000 foot view. And this, this gets exciting. So we're, we're a school board and we've decided, whoa, what are, what are the things that's guaranteed we need our students to learn? What are those needs? What are our learning expectations? What are our graduation requirements? All schools must have this. And here's the way, the framework that we're going to use to make sure that our schools are meeting those guaranteed curriculum, those learning expectations, that, that safe school, um, all, the, all the things that you believe makes that successful school. You, you have a very clear framework for your schools to meet those needs. That's part of their application process. How are they going to do that? How are they going to measure themselves? But then if you do contract, it's part of the monitoring process whether that's a one-year contract or a five-year contract. And that is going to be a decision tool then for you as a district school um, authorizer, a decision-making tool to decide whether or not you are going to recontract with that school. And then the bottom is your portfolio of schools. So there could be different schools that have different specific designs to meet different needs in your community or different ideas from parents that what they would like to see in their schools but it still all needs to funnel through what your indicators of success are, your guaranteed curriculum and your learning expectations from a district. And you're constantly measuring that, whether that is every quarter, there, there's a presentation to you as a school board, or there's a presentation, if you as a, as a district authorizer are hiring a different group to monitor those schools, maybe that's the district office, they're, they're constantly delivering reports back to you to say, yes, each of our portfolio schools are meeting these needs, here are the metrics, here are the measurements um, from those. This one is not, and here's our corrective action plan um, that, that we have asked them to create. And these are the actions that they're going to be taking over the course of the next six to 12 months to make sure that they move the needle on where we expect um, them to be based on our performance measure metric. So what does this mean for kids? 
If there's a portfolio of autonomous schools for, for not only your kids, but your families and your community to know that there are different schools that have a unique design. Maybe that's that innovation center. There's opportunities and choice for your families. There's different learning environments that meet the needs of different students, whether that's, um, you know, in our current COVID times, we recognize that virtual doesn't work for all students, but it really works well for some. Is that an option? Um, it, it, are all the needs of students not necessarily being met at, at one building, but there are other options in that district to meet those needs and parents are, are being supported by the district to make those decisions that, that each one of their own children might have different strengths and weaknesses that, that align differently for, for the different portfolio of schools that you might have. And those community connections, that, that financial sustainability that we already um, talked about. But again, it's all coming back to your clear performance metric and your expectations of what, what makes a successful school in your community. All right. So you may be asking then, you know, what, what is our mission as a district? You know, going back on some of these reflection questions, what are our district needs? You know, would charters help? How would we do this? What's the application process? You know, what if we don't authorize? Are there downsides to, you know, what are the pros and cons? Um, how do we get help? All that kind of stuff. So um, I don't want your brain spinning too much, um, but we do have some really good guidance on like, um, you know, what, what it would look like in the financials and we have templates for applications and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I just wanted to take a minute here to let you know how works can help. So um, if you want to know more, if you have questions about the roadblocks and, you know, what you'd have to do and, you know, just overcoming some of those hurdles, we have a ton of online resources at the end of the slideshow and a little bit throughout the slideshow, we've linked you to all of our videos, documents, guides, all kinds of things. Um, plus you can find them just on our website. All of it's available to you at no cost. It's funded through the federal grant. Um, and we're here to meet with you one-on-one -on -one too. So we put in our support email and a link to our request form as well. So you can just let us know that you have some questions and you wanna talk about what it would look like in your district. And we'll just brainstorm with you. I mean, there's no, um, we're, we're certainly not going to try to push you one way or the other. We just want you to have all of the information that you need to navigate some of these decisions. Um, so like I said, we're a statewide center. We're housed at CESA 9 um, and it's all funded through the grant. We're here to just support, to improve student learning um, and provide resources for charter schools. We work with a lot of partners throughout the state. Um, some of them are charter schools, some of them are CESAs, and then other con consulting organizations that have the resources that we wanted to make available to the charter schools. So we've really kind of collected and curated and created some resources to have everything that you would need to run a really successful charter school. Um, we have resources available for you, the authorizers, but also for the governance boards and the leaders and teachers, also for the community. Um, and so know that, you know, as you're going through this, you're going to be supported at all those different um, perspectives. And then we're also just really trying to build the capacity of the state and make sure that we all have those answers and that knowledge and the information we need and the connections we need to make sure that we're um, doing really good work together and all throughout the state. So we have this authorizer index of resources um, that we link to right here on this slide. So you can click the image um, or you can get to this from our website and it'll have all those different videos and um, slideshows and templates and things that you would need to get started. Uh, but we often do just say, give us a call. <laughs> here we are. Um, so that's, you would talk to Angie or Nick or I if you call or email um, and we're all just really happy to be here to support you and the good work you're doing with kids and, um, and in your you know, potential future endeavors around charter schools. So thank you so much. Uh, we're here to answer questions and um, we're, yeah, we just wanna encourage you to do good work. So thank you so much. Thank you.